Well, good morning, everybody. Morning. Welcome to the number four in our uh, summer Bible school series. Anybody been to all four? Elaine, you don't count. You're, you're paid to be here. Anybody else? Well done. Uh, Gwyneth, yeah, Bill, yeah. So speak to Elaine afterwards. Elaine said she'll buy anybody a Mars bar who's been at all four sessions. Well done, Elaine. No, it's Kathy's dairy milk, she'll buy Elaine didn't know that she said that, but I'm just telling you. Welcome if you're watching online as well. We're glad to have you with us. Let's begin with a prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day, another day of your goodness to us. Thank you that uh, each day your mercies are new. Lord, we thank you that as we gather together as brothers and sisters, we have a unique bond under the banner of your love. We thank you for your word, which instructs us and corrects us and provides us with a roadmap for life. And Lord, we pray that as we look again into this amazing story of Ruth and Boaz and Naomi, that you will speak to us, that you will give us something that we can take away and help us in our own journey of faith with you. We give you thanks now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, shall we just get right into it this morning? If you have a Bible, turn to Ruth chapter 4. If you've forgotten a Bible, there are some there. If you prefer just to watch, if you can see on the screen, it's very bright this morning. I don't think I've ever had to contemplate preaching in sunglasses before, but it is a possibility. Um, but we're going to read Ruth chapter 4 together as we get going this morning. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me, so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this the guardian redeemer said, Then I cannot redeem it, because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to another, to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today you are witnesses." Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life, 
and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. Do you like it when a, a, a story ends well? When we watch a movie together, Ali loves a happy ending. And usually within the first two or three minutes of the film, Ali could probably give you a broad brushstroke of how the film is going to go and how it's going to play out and how it's going to end. I don't like that in a film. I like to be kept guessing. But in this story, you have a happy ending. But it's not without its ups and downs, as we've seen in the last three weeks. And this morning, we, we reach this final installment in the story of Ruth. Or is it the story of Naomi? Or is it the story of Boaz? <clears throat> Remember where we left events last time? Naomi had crafted a plan to get Ruth and Boaz connected. In the threshing room at midnight, Ruth had lain at Boaz's feet until he'd woken from his slumber and, and found her there and was surprised. And she had made a bold move for him to take care of her, to live up to his role of kinsman redeemer, taking care not only of her, but also of Naomi. And Boaz, to his great credit, had responded positively to that. But he had indicated that there was a problem. There was another man with a more senior role within the tribe who could legitimately take priority over Boaz. Boaz said he would speak to him. And if he was unwilling to redeem uh, Ruth and Naomi, then Boaz pledged that he would do it. And so chapter 3, you'll remember, closed with Naomi assuring Ruth that Boaz would deal with the situation directly. And so it proves, as chapter 4 opens with these words. Meanwhile, Boaz, this demonstrates right away, Boaz is acting decisively to win Ruth for himself and to secure that future for Naomi and for Ruth. We read that he had gone to the city gate. This was the most strategic point in the city. In some ways, it was the centre of city life. This was where disputes were settled. Psalm 127 verse 5 speaks of contending with enemies in the gate. Deuteronomy 22.15 explains that this is where the elders of the city would gather to dispense justice. I did a little bit of digging into this and, and looked in the, the IV, IVP Bible background commentary. I just want to read you a couple of paragraphs. It says this, The gate area in Israelite cities was an open space that was the hub of activity. Merchants, visitors, messengers and judges all frequented that area and conducted their business there. Numerous excavations have produced gate plans showing that often there were benches lining the whole area where people could meet for various purposes. The elders, usually clan leaders or heads of household, served as the governing body of the city. Judicial and legal matters were in their hands. Here, there is no legal judgment to pass, but they would oversee the legal transaction to assure that all was done according to law and custom, as well as serve as witnesses to the transaction. Now, interestingly, a typical gate complex would comprise four different rooms, two on each side. Each one would comfortably seat 12 men. One side of the rooms was open, so you could see the flow of traffic in and out of the city. No one would leave, no one would arrive without the elders of the city being aware or being made aware of it. And so this is where we find Boaz at the crack of dawn, ready to put his plan into action. 
And from here, he would have a fine vantage point as the more senior kinsman redeemer enters. Come over here, my friend. Sit down, he calls in verse 1. And from there on in, we see a masterclass by Boaz in winsomeness, in shrewdness, in clever calculation. He's skillful without ever being cunning. He's wise without ever being untruthful. And he's tactical without ever being unfair. At home in our house through the years, we have loved to play the card game Uno. Anyone else play Uno? It's great in caravans, isn't it, Ruth? Many wet caravan holidays have been whiled away playing Uno until the rain subsides. Modesty obviously prohibits me from telling me who usually wins, but uh, when you're playing Uno or when you're playing other card games, you have to learn that there is a particular skill in learning the order in which to lay your cards down, otherwise you're going to hand victory on the plate to your opponent. Now I think Boaz would have been an excellent Uno player. We see him play his cards just right. When he first introduces the, the proposition to the kinsman redeemer, he emphasizes Naomi, the widow of Elimelech. He emphasizes the portion of land that she owns that needs to be redeemed. Doesn't mention Ruth at this point, did you notice? He lays out the fact that if this more senior man will not redeem it, he's willing to step in and take the deal. And this is all being played out, remember, in front of the city elders at the gate. Initially, to the kinsman redeemer, this sounds like a great deal, a good offer. Naomi has no children. She has no possibility of having children. She's an older lady. Yeah, I'll take her on. And when she dies, then the land will become mine and there's none of Elimelech's line left. So he dives in, doesn't he, at the end of verse 4. I will redeem it. And Boaz goes into his hand and plays his ace. Very well. But if you buy the field from Naomi, then you're also buying Ruth, the Moabite widow, so that the field will stay in the dead man's family. It's like surprise. At this point, you almost see the man physically blanch. Huh? He says, what's that? Yeah. Could you just repeat that? Suddenly, what seemed like a very good deal has become rather more complex. Why? Because in the deal that he had in his mind, he would buy Naomi's land, care for her for a few years, and then when she dies, the land is his, with no other factors. But now, with the added details that Boaz has now skillfully revealed that he would have to buy back, redeem the land. He would still have to care for Naomi for a few years, but he would also have to marry the younger widow, Ruth. He would have to support her for the rest of her life. He would have to support her children that she would have to him. But here's the real kicker. The children wouldn't even get his name. The children would perpetuate Elimelech's line. So when those children grow, the land would be theirs, not his. You can see why all of a sudden this is not such an attractive proposition or transaction to enter into. What started out as an outstanding opportunity to grow his property portfolio has become something that will be really tying for the rest of his life. And as was hinted at in the text, it would have an impact on his own wealth. And so in verse 6, he slams the brakes on the deal. I cannot redeem it. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. And in the language of dragons then, I'm out. He may be more senior than Boaz in the line of kinsman redeemer, but he's not so committed to the role. And so Boaz's clever playing of the cards in his hand has paid off. And then you have this peculiar sight of the man taking off his sandal. No, I don't want that, Kevin. Taking off his sandal, 
and presenting it to Boaz, the equivalent of a handshake. Verse 7 explains that this was the custom when property was being bought and sold. And we're not sure why this was the case. One theory is that it relates back to God's promise to Moses in Joshua 1, where God says that he would give him every place that he would set his foot. There is the thought that there's a link there. But the key thing is that it took place in front of the witnesses at the gate. And so in the future, if there was ever any query or ever any dispute about what had happened, they would be able to confirm that the deal was done because they saw the man taking off his sandal and presenting it to Boaz. I prefer a handshake. I don't know about you. And Boaz had what he'd come for. The land that belonged to his relative Elimelech. A future and security for Naomi. Most of all, he had secured the hand of marriage, of hand in marriage of Ruth. Ruth has been redeemed. Naomi's plan has come to fruition. Don't you love a happy ending? In verses 11 and 12, we see that the word had started to spread. Not just the elders at the gate, but now the other people around hear what's happened. And so they begin to wish Boaz and his new family well. And they express their desire that Ruth will be like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. They express their desire that Boaz's house will be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. They express their desire that he will act worthily in Ephrathah, that his, his name will be renowned in Bethlehem. And there's so much going on in just these two verses. The reference to Rachel and Leah. That's a call back to the very founding of the nation of Israel. The reference to Perez and Tamar. That's a call back to the very founding of their tribe, the tribe of Judah. This is heritage language. This is family tree. Who do you think you are? Well, the line of Elimelech had been in perilous danger of dying out, hadn't it? But now that line will be restored. How? Through the union of Ruth, the Moabites, and Boaz, her kinsman redeemer. You might remember from early on in our study that the name Ephratha means fruitful. And their desire is that um, Ruth and Boaz will be fruitful, that they will produce a family, and that that line is going to be continued through them. Is Boaz concerned that the children will take on Elimelech's name rather than his own, like the other kinsman redeemer who had pulled out of the deal? Not a bit. He's driven by integrity and love and commitment. And the rest, it seems, is just detail. Their desire is that he be renowned in Bethlehem, the so-called house of bread. And Boaz and Ruth would have had no way of knowing it, of course. But they would indeed bring honour to that town of Bethlehem, Ephrathah. They would continue the Elimelech line that would lead to the mighty King David. And of course that would go on to lead to the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, in that same house of bread in Bethlehem, one would be born who would be known as the bread of life. So a book that began with three funerals concludes with a wedding. Somebody should make a film about that, shouldn't they? (laughs) Concludes with a wedding and a baby being born. From the tears, from the sorrow, from the bereavement of chapter 1, we have reached happiness, joy, and fulfillment here in chapter 4. From the overwhelming stench of death and hopelessness at the beginning of the story, we have reached this place of freshness, new life, hope, restoration as we approach the end. Look how the women greet Naomi in verse 14. Blessed is the Lord, who has not left you without a redeemer today. May his name become famous in Israel. 
This is referring to the baby called Obed, which meant servant. He is the one who will carry on the family name. They tell Naomi that this little one is going to renew your life, is going to sustain you in your old age. Now you grandmothers who are here today, you know what that feels like, don't you? When you hold your grandchildren, it renews your life. It reinvigorates you. It gives you hope. It cheers you up. Especially because you can hand them back. <laughs> but Naomi has come full circle. Naomi, meaning pleasant, sweet, had gone to being Mara, bitter. Now, she's having her hope restored the bitterness is being replaced by something altogether more wholesome. Hope, restoration, family, future, connection, relevance. Her life has gone from a barren emptiness, a resignation to her sad existence, to being one which is now overflowing with new possibilities. And the women recognize that Ruth is the reason for this newness of life in Naomi. Ruth is the reason that Naomi is her pleasant old self again. They say of Ruth that she's better to Naomi than seven sons. Seven sons was thought to be the greatest blessing a mother could receive. I'm not sure people in this room would maybe buy into that theory. But why do they say that? Because she has given her this grandson, Obed. But do you notice where their praise is directed in verse 14? It's not to Naomi, it's not to Boaz, it's not even to Ruth, but it's to the Lord God himself. Praise be to the Lord. Blessed is the Lord. They recognize that he is the one who has brought these circumstances to pass. If Naomi has experienced a massive change in her circumstances, then so has Ruth. Living in the land of Moab, she meets and marries an immigrant refugee who then dies fairly soon into their marriage. She leaves the familiarity of home and she pledges herself to her mother-in-law, herself deep in grief. She relocates to a foreign land with all its differences of culture and religion, far away from her own family and friends. And now she has been redeemed by this amazing man, Boaz. She's a wife. She's a mother. She's no longer Ruth the Moabitess. She is now Ruth, the wife of Boaz, the mother of Obed. She's well regarded. She's revered among the people. But the best is yet to come. And the best is some way off. Because the best will happen long after Ruth and Boaz and Naomi and Obed have lived and died. And at the end of the book, we read a list of names showing that the Elimelech line did indeed survive. Not only survive, but prospered. Not only survive, but it led to the life of David, the shepherd boy who would go on to be the great king. And then, at the start of Matthew's Gospel, we read another list, a much longer list, a list that begins even before Boaz and Ruth, a, a list that begins back at Abraham, the so-called father of the nation, but which also goes way past David, the shepherd boy king, and leads directly to the birth of the Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus, born through the line of David to the virgin girl Mary in Bethlehem. Folks, if you look at the story of Ruth, we'll learn this, that God's planning is meticulous. His eye for detail, as we thought yesterday in church, is just incredible. And the symmetry of the story is an exquisite work of art in itself. How do we finish then? Well, there are some passages of the Bible that we just skip past. We look at them and go, well, I'm not reading that. Move on. Not today, though. We are going to read a passage that we all skip past. Let's look just for a few moments and read together the first 17 verses of Matthew's Gospel. 
I'm reminded from 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. These verses in Matthew 1 are really vital. And we couldn't read and do the story of Ruth without reading these verses as we close our time together. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, Jesse, the father of King David. Still a way to go yet, folks. Are you hanging in there? David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram, Jehoram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amon, Amon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud. Abihud, the father of Eliakim. Eliakim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Akim. Akim, the father of Elihud. Elihud, the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of Mathan. Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus, there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. God is a meticulous planner. There's great symmetry there's great progression through there, isn't there? Is it the story of Ruth? Is it the story of Boaz? Is it the story of Naomi? Or is it the story of God working out his eternal purposes, preparing the way for the ultimate kinsman redeemer? You will notice that Ruth is, just one, of, is one of just four women mentioned in this family line of Jesus. Think about them. Tamar who disguised herself as a prostitute and seduced Judah, which resulted in Perez being born. Rahab, who was a prostitute and who concealed the Israelite spies in return for her freedom and protection. Bathsheba, who committed adultery with David and whose husband was then killed out of expediency at David's order. And Ruth, a foreigner, an outsider, an interloper from an enemy land, an immigrant, viewed, no doubt, with suspicion at first. And yet all four find themselves and find their place in the family tree of Jesus, the Messiah, the promised Saviour. How amazing that God takes seeming nobodies and places them right in the centre of his plan to reach the world with his goodness, and God still does that today. We heard from Kevin just last week how there are no nobodies in God's eyes. Don't ever think that God can't use you and your life. He can and he will. And he will take that little mustard seed of faith that we have and he can move the, those mountains that are right in front of us. All he looks for us, all he looks for in us rather, is obedience, integrity, faith, all the things we've seen in this study. So as we conclude our studies in Ruth, it's interesting to consider just what it was that saved Naomi, just what it was that saved Ruth from their plight of bereavement 
and a hopeless future. In one sense, you could say it was the law that saved them. This leveret law that we thought about last week where a kinsman redeemer figure, the goyle, would be obliged to take on responsibility for his fellow tribes people who were in dire straits. Without that law, it's hard to see how the situation could have been resolved. But the law alone couldn't secure freedom. It couldn't give them the future. The law also needed Ruth to play her part and show her dogged perseverance, her loyalty, her love, her tenacity, her creativity, her boldness. The law couldn't have done it alone if it wasn't for Boaz and his integrity and his shrewdness and compassion and decisiveness and love and determination. The law couldn't have done it alone without Naomi's desires and dreams, her planning, her hopes, her prayers. But as well as this, it needed, and, and more than anything else, and this is where we're going to finish this session, it needed God's guiding hand. It needed God's intervention. It needed God to honour his faithful people. It needed God to work his purposes out as only God can and does. Intricately weaving his plan through the lives of these individuals, these people in their unique circumstances, it needed him, the grand architect, to have the big picture in front of him, the blueprint for salvation, as he looked down history to the day when he would deliver to the world the ultimate kinsman redeemer, the Lord Jesus himself. In sending Jesus, we see where law and grace meet, and law and grace combine to produce holiness, and we see that holiness most perfectly, of course, in the person, the lovely person of the Lord Jesus. Like Boaz, Jesus would go to great lengths to win his bride. Like Boaz, Jesus has pledged to make us his own. And like Boaz, Jesus stayed true to his promises. Just watch this little video it's only about 30 seconds blink and you'll miss it and then i'm going to pray hope you can see that few years ago when the programme Who Do You Think You Are started, I got quite excited about doing my own family tree and I got right into it and I uh, got back to both on my father and my mother's side, back to around the mid 1700s, which was pretty good. But to go any further back, I would actually need to traipse across the water to Ireland and actually do the hard yards going, actually going round, physically going round cemeteries because the Irish records were all destroyed. And that's where our family were in the mid-1700s. But, you know, that's my family tree right there. And if you're a believer in Jesus, that's your family tree. We're sons and daughters of the King, the Most High. Let's pray together. Our Father in Heaven, just as Ruth from Moab became one of your people, so you have called us by name. So you have invited us in to your home and we are so glad to find shelter under your wings Lord Jesus thank you for your costly self-giving and redeeming love setting us free to share the life of your family Holy Spirit continue to lead us into truth and give us a daily awareness of the grace of God in our life as he weaves his plan through us so we bring you our praise we bring you our thanks in the name of our kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ, your son, our saviour. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here, whether you've been today for the first time or you've been at most or all of the sessions. Next week, 
Uh, we're going to start just a, a three-week series to take us through to the end of the summer time. Next week, we're going to begin a new series with a new character. And over the next three weeks, we're going to consider the enigmatic character of Samson, surely one of the most colourful characters in all of the Old Testament. And I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you for watching online. Tune in again soon.